social protection measures, especially cash ta transfer programs, clearly impact positively on the food and nutrition security and livelihood uh, of the program beneficiaries. Beyond this, what is the subsequent effect of the cash injections on the communities or even entire economies? Well, cash transfer programs can have an impact on the economy and the local economies in which uh, the beneficiaries live. They buy goods and services. Most of the time they buy goods and services from the community itself um, and from businesses that are owned by community members. Right? And so when they buy those goods and services, the, the other community members who own those uh, shops can uh, earn profit off the, the, the selling of, of goods and services. Now, the, this impact on the local economy is greater uh, in the, when the production of the goods which are being you know, bought and sold is, are local instead of being imported from the outside. Right? And so it varies a lot from community to community. But for example, we've done work looking at what is the impact, uh, simulating models to see what is the, the income multiplier that's generated by these programs. In Ghana, for example, for every dollar that's given in transfer, about $2.5 are generated in total income for the community. Um, now, the, a lot of that extra income, those spillovers, actually goes to non-beneficiaries, right? The people who own the, the stores um, or who are selling the goods or who are producing the, the food, which is then sold to, to the beneficiaries. And so it actually has quite a significant impact on, on the local economy. Do you have any sort of information how actually the split up is, how much is bought in terms of more productive means to get more purchases or to get more income? Here we're talking about the poorest of the poor that are receiving these transfers. And generally, in most contexts, they're spending 50, 60, even 70 percent on food. But also very important are purchases of, of simple uh, implements for agriculture, as well as inputs, whether they be seeds or fertilizer, or pesticides for, for production. Um, or And another important uh, purchase, item purchase is often uh, uh, shoes for children, uniforms for children. Is there a special quality in social protection schemes that are geared towards women? The, the issue of gender in terms of the design, the targeting, um, and beneficiaries of, of social protection schemes is very important. Um, a lot of schemes are targeted towards uh, females or the senior female in a household because there's a feeling that women tend to spend the money Uh, more in terms of the family's needs, right, in terms of children's needs on food, um, bas basically, basically because of the cultural division of labor in, in many households. For that reason, many programs are, in fact, targeted specifically towards, towards women. Um, now, there is a big discussion as to, well, actually, how much can these programs actually change the, this intra-household dynamic between men and women, which is so important for, for rural development, right? Because women are disadvantaged in many ways in terms of, obviously, in terms of structurally, in terms of access to assets, what have you, and culturally in terms of many of the internal dynamics in, in a household. And so there is some thought that these programs can actually, because they're targeted to women, can actually help strengthen them in terms of this intra-household dynamic with uh, their husbands, partners, with the males in, in the family. Um, the actual evidence is unclear. Uh, a lot of beneficiaries report that indeed it does, uh, you know, it helps, it gives them some more standing in terms of dealing with their husband because now they have their own independent source of income. Um, they have a bit more say in terms of what goes on in the household, and what have you. So in a way, you could also argue that your measures should actually target the leak in the household and should actually look after the husbands and uh, see how they uh, actually work with the family. I think the empirical ev evidence is quite clear. Whether you give it to a man or a woman, the family uses the money uh, in a positive way. The man might use it on different things. It may, if the man is more in, the, uh, in, in charge of the productive activities of the household, he may be more likely to use it in investment in, in agriculture rather than in, you know, ch uh, shoes for the kid, for example, right, that. Um, so it kind of depends on the objective of the program. Now, I, I do think it is important that you can't ignore the man, that if there are issues around, you know, the cultural division of labor and around this, uh, you know, an unbalanced intra-household dynamic, the program can't ignore the men. Most developed countries nowadays consider social protection measures as 
a deep foundation of their prosperity, of the fact that they are where they are now. Then you have their development aid. And my perception is that they're not really spending so much money on, on schemes that help developing countries to actually set up similar things. There's a process undergoing where governments are beginning to realize, one, that it is economically viable to, to slowly build up uh, systems um, eventually to be to be national, right? And that they do play a very important role in terms of the economic prosperity of, of the country, right? Uh -huh. um, but it's a process of uh, it's, it's just a, it's 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 part of the development process. I see it, and so it's a so I think it's a combination of factors. On the one hand, it's um, a number of the European countries not putting a lot of emphasis on it, but also the developing countries resisting um, as well there is this perception that it's charity and will lead to dependency, right? I mean, there's also, in a lot of countries in the North as well, there's this idea that it is charity and dependency, right, as well. But it's, I think, at least in, you know, like in the U.S., certainly, for example, <laughs> for example. But I think in Europe, for the most part, I would imagine that most societies more or less feel as though it's not charity, but rather it's a right and it's, you know, part of the, of the foundations of the society, no? Uh, the other point is that comes to my mind that goes hand in hand with that is what Jeremy Rifkin had said. If we're looking for employment as a solution to our problems, and that's what the developing countries are doing, then we're in trouble because that's not what's going to happen in the next hundred years. Anything on the horizons? Is there anything in terms of, of that with the uh, developing countries to look after that the social protection measures don't necessarily look into this almost ideology of having to get people into employment as a solution to their general uh, developing issues? Right. That's a big question, right? I mean, I, I, would, I would argue that probably the most ministries of the economy and most governments in, in sub-Saharan Africa would probably don't ascribe to this idea that uh, um, around employment and the fact that you can have too much <laughs> too much employment because I think their problem is the other side, right? They have, you know, generations of, of young people coming into the labor market who don't have much perspective of jobs and they're somewhat desperate to find something for them to do, right? And to find... And so I think... And I think, it, I mean... While it's true, perhaps, uh, I mean, certainly the, the, the challenge countries face now is different than, than the challenge other countries faced, you know, 50 or 100 years ago, right? I still think that, you know, you need economic growth, you need jobs, perhaps not for everyone, but you certainly need, a, you know, a base, uh, a productive base for your economy. We're talking in the terms of, of, you know, the poorest part of the population getting money in order to basically have, you know, to have their basic needs, right? And I think the evidence is so clear that, you know, that the, this issue of dependency and people wasting the money and going and drinking, when, when you're talking at those levels of poverty, it's, it's a non-issue, right? Because people are surviving and people are using the money to get ahead. And again, there, there are no jobs, right? So they have to create their own jobs. And that means either through agriculture or some little business or some little something on the side of the road because there's very few other opportunities, right? And so people are quite... Uh, you know, ingen you know, there's a lot of ingenuity in terms of figuring out, okay, what can I do to get ahead? Because I only have my own uh, hands to work, right? And so I have to come up with my own ideas. And so I think this issue of worrying about people not working is, is a non-issue, particularly at those levels of, of, devel of development, right? Um, and it becomes a different issue, I think, when you're a, you know, a high-income country, then, okay, then there's some issues around, you know, what are the incentives? Maybe you need to look after the children because that's where you can actually get that ingenuity, that spirit still to get something going. If somebody's been living for a long time in poverty, you know, it's probably more the exception that they're going to change and going to be part of the society and do all the things. What do you think? The key, obviously, of this of kind of breaking this intergenerational transfer of poverty is, as, as, as you say, it's children, right? And making sure, number one, that they get the education and they get the health in order to be able to, to participate in a different way than their parents, basically, right? Um, and so really it's strong health systems, strong education uh, that can facilitate, that, that facilitates, you know, joining, being really being able to leave, to leave uh, poverty, right? Um, and so a lot of the social protection programs, the, really the focus is on children, 
right? And how can we support children? How can we make sure they have a safe transition out of, uh, out of you know, adolescence? This is particularly true in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And these programs actually uh, can help that, that transition as well. And so there, there's a number of dimensions of these programs which really are focusing on children, right? And this idea that uh, it's the next generation is the generation that's going to be able to leave poverty. But of course, it doesn't just depend on the social protection because, again, you need to have economic opportunity. You need to have the, you know, it, it, better education doesn't help unless you have a job in order to, to put it to use uh, with, higher, with higher productivity. A good example of this is Mexico, for example. Mexico has one of the biggest conditional cash transfer programs. It's been active for, you know, 20 years almost by now. But I think, and they had this idea that by giving uh, education, basic health, by making it, you didn't get the money unless you sent your kids to school, right? And so there was a big increase in, in help. But the people were eventually going to leave poverty through the labor market, right? So they stopped giving much support to agriculture. They just assumed that people were going to, that the economy was going to take off and the labor market was going to pull all these people out of poverty. But it didn't happen. The labor market, the economy didn't generate jobs like it was supposed to. And so 20 years later, you actually have similar level, levels of poverty in Mexico than you did uh, 20 years ago, right? And so. So you really, you have to, there ha, you can't just rely on the social protection, the economy has to respond as well. I mean, another good example is South Africa. We were talking, South Africa has probably the, 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 the best social protection system in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's at least a quarter of the population receives a cash transfer in Sub-Saharan Africa between pensions and between child grants, right? But be, because of the nature of the economy, which is an economy based on mostly on natural resources, it's very unequal. It doesn't generate a lot of jobs for youth. You have massive youth unemployment, right? And so social protection has, it's a great safety net and it helps to a certain extent to, to, for youth to go on the labor market. But unless you generate opportunities, it can only do so much, right? And so you really have to have the two together to have a longer term perspective of, of for the next generation to get out of poverty. Is there a way for FAO maybe to to look through the system and behind the scenes to, to, to check out whether this is instrumentalized or whatever you want to call it? Well, you can't you can't ignore politics, right? And I think it's probably even more likely that a democratic government is more susceptible to the to the, to the politics of social protection than a totalitarian government, right? So there's two sides of this coin. On the one hand, um, when one is advocating for these kinds of programs, uh, you know, governments see that this is something that's popular, right? Now, it's often not popular with the elites. It's something that's popular with, you know, the working classes or the poorer classes, basically. And it, and it is something that can get the government support in rural areas or in different areas, right? Um, but I also think that it's... Um, but I also think there can be, there's a joining of interests in a way, right? Because we want to bring in as many of the poor as possible into these programs, right? What you want to avoid is that they become used as political tools, right? And that there's, you know, there's use of the instruments of a program in order to get out the vote or to vote in a certain way, right? Or that certain people get yeah. in favor and inclusiveness is a big issue. Right. With this new generation of programs in the last 15, 20 years, right? The vast majority of them are very... Um, they're not apolitical in the way they're implemented, but they're implemented in a way that is transparent and um, has not been perverted by the political process, right? And so politics enters. So for example, you take the question of Ghana, right? Ghana, they have this pro the, the elite program. And the way they implemented the program, instead of going into a few regions first, for political reasons, basically, they put little, they put the program in everyone's electoral district, but a little bit, right? So it had the, you know it was it was correctly targeted. I mean, it targeted the poorest households, but it was spread out over the whole country, in in a in a very um, uh, thin fashion instead of concentrating in certain areas, in order to get political support from from parliament. Okay, so that isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? Um, but it certainly responds to political needs, right? Um, there certainly are there. Um, there is a struggle when you when you want to scale up these programs. There's often uh, there's a tension between Parliament, which wants to see these programs in the division, versus you know a more rational way of scaling up, right? Or wanting to really focus on the most geographically uh, disadvantaged areas at first, right? But sometimes you have to make compromises in order to get the political support to scale this to scale this up, right? Um, 
and I think so. I think you know, I, but I, I can't think of a of a country where it's actually been used either implicitly or explicitly as like a vote getting measure. Now, I think part of that has to do with a lot of the not South Africa, but certainly in Ethiopia and many of the other countries. Uh, at least initially, there's a lot of donor involvement, right? And the donors to give money for these kinds of programs are very uh, demanding in terms of transparency and making sure that you know there's little corrupt, there's no corruption and and all these things. And so I would say that in social protection, particularly the cash, ironically, there's much less corruption than there is in almost any other kind of subsidy program, right? Because uh, because it's cash, they feel as though they need to be much more transparent, and there's many more controls over how the money is done, right? But things like fertilizer, or the things like in-kind subsidies, historically there's been a lot more abuse, I would say, mm. political abuse, and of, of the of the of the transfers. Is it maybe when the donor agencies they, I don't know, do they have people that are specialized in in social protection, or is it necessary that you go via the traditional silos of agriculture to actually mainstream it that way? The merit of, of the work that we've done has been to precisely bring kind of the social protection agenda into agriculture and the agriculture into the social protection agenda, right? And it was something that's, that, that, that people were seeing that this, was, that this was necessary, right? That you have these social protection instruments, but they're, real, they're benefiting people who are involved in, in agriculture, Right. And you needed something to help people kind of get better potential out of their out of their livelihoods. Um, and so I think it's actually the only way to make this sustainable. The only way for this to actually be part of something which can over the long term bring people out of poverty is, is to, in fact, make these connections and to make these linkages and to link them explicitly. Right. And so for me, it's fundamental. It's we shouldn't disentangle them. In fact, we have to figure out how to how to entangle them, <laughs> entangle them more in a logical way, of course. So what is your message to the donors and the implementing agencies? If you look at some agencies like uh, DFID, right, which were very supportive of social protection, but really focused on just on social protection. And over time, once they got the social protection going, over time they've been opening up and saying, okay, we need to, we need, we need to now begin to link this with other activities, right? So this whole idea... We're building up a social protection system, but we need to we need to link it with access to other services and other sectors, right? And so I think it's important for development agencies to do that. I think we saw it today in the in the presentation where you get the different sectors coming together and talking about how these these things go together. And so, I, in terms of um, a lot of the European development agencies, I think we're beginning to see that kind of uh, the need to move in that direction. And so. Um, I think the message has been is slowly being taken on, right? I think with some of the others, like the Americans, for example, they're still a little bit in the in the past, right? And I think it's important for them to <laughs> to open up a little bit and see how these 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 things come together. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. <laughs>